Trust you have your Bibles. We're back in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. And we will find our way into verse 17. Jesus is starting His way out into Jerusalem. Okay, He's finding His way. Not finding. He's starting His way into Jerusalem. Doing the will of the Father. It says that when He was gone forth into the way, there comes one running and kneeling to Him and asked Him, Good Master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Whoa! Are you kidding me? This is really happening? Jesus is with His disciples. They're making their way to Jerusalem. And on the way, a rich young ruler, somebody who has great wealth, comes running up to Him and says what? Good Master, what may I do or what do I have to do that I may inherit eternal life? Wow. Talk about having yourself a hot one, huh? Talk about just not having to do much, it seems, on the, on the outside. But then when you look into the story, you find out that the story is going in a complete different direction. Let this be a, a wake-up call to us all. Here you've got somebody running up to the Lord Jesus Christ. What may I do to inherit eternal life? What do I have to do? Now today's mindset would be what? Hey man, just say the prayer, believe on Jesus, and you're in. You're a lock. I mean, this is a prime one right here, right? We've talked about in the past evangelism 101. This would, be the, this would be the one in Evangelism 101 if you have somebody show up like this. I mean, come on, you, you've got him. you got him right where you want him. Can't beat it. It's as if the Holy Spirit's bringing him to you. He asks a question. He's even a man of questions. He kneels to him. Good master. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? Wow. Jesus says unto him, Why do you call me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. Now what do we say from time to time here at church? When you evangelize somebody, okay? When you evangelize somebody, sooner or later you must get them to the backdrop of the law of God. Okay? They have to see what? The reason for eternal life. The reason for why they need Jesus. They have to see that. Now, there's not a teacher greater than the Lord Jesus Christ, and He shows us this, okay? He shows us, He says this, You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Not bear false witness, defraud not, honor thy father and thy mother. Jesus gives him the law. He says, this is the law. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to keep this law. And what's the guy say? He answers and says unto him, All these, everything you've mentioned, I've observed from my youth. I, I have never lusted after a woman. I've never killed anybody. I've never stolen anything. I don't bear a false witness. I defraud not. And I honor my father and my mother from my youth. I mean, this guy's perfect, isn't he? You see, this is what you do. 
This is a prime example of, of how you do it. You bring the law before the person and you show them. You get them to the point to where they see what? I cannot keep the law. I can't keep it. It's impossible, right? It's impossible for me to keep the law. Listen, we know without a doubt... This rich young ruler did not carry out every one of these commandments perfectly. He's lying right there. Okay? But he believes in his mind that he's what? Good enough. He believes in his mind that he's good enough, that he hasn't sinned and broken any of these laws, at least that are mentioned here. He believes that, that everything is good in his life. I mean, he... He believes he hasn't offended a holy God. He answers and says unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. I kept the law. I've kept it. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, One thing thou lacks, go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor. And you will have great treasure in heaven and come take up the cross and follow me. So now the Lord Jesus asks him another question. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to sell everything you have. I want you to give it up. Give it to the poor. Give everything up you have. Leave it all. Leave all your earthly treasures. Leave everything earthly and come and follow me. That's what you can do. And he was sad at that saying and he went away grieved for he had a great possession. You see the teacher above all teachers knows man's heart, doesn't he? Jesus knows the heart of man. And he knew what it was that drove this man. What it was that made him tick. It was his what? His great possessions. His great possessions. He tells him, he says, give it up. And take up the cross. The cross of what? The cross of suffering. And follow me. You follow me. You give it all away. You walk away from everything and you come to me and you will have eternal life. You can have eternal life. You just give it all up. The man couldn't, could he? A lot of people living today and a lot of people lived in the past and a lot will live in the future if the Lord tarries who have so much and who won't give anything up. They just won't. But here's a prime example of being very careful in evangelism. Just because somebody comes running up to you and or asks you a question about Christ does not mean that they're going to come to faith in the very one that they asked you about. You be careful. Be very careful. Because like I said before, this guy here is, I mean, he is Evangelism 101. Today's evangelist was, would do what? Well, come on up here, buddy. Let me talk to you. I'll say a prayer. You'll sign this card. We'll get you in. You're good to go. You're now of the family of God. But the Lord Jesus says no. He puts up the backdrop of the law before him and says, keep it. God yeah, says, oh, I've kept it. And he says, okay. Then give up everything you've got and follow me. Just give it up. You see, that's what it is when you come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, isn't it? Giving it up if He asks. Giving it up. Giving up your lifestyle. 
walking away from who you once were to a new desire, a new want, a new drive, a new everything. The radical change. If any man is in Christ, he's what? A new creation, right? He's new. He's changed. This guy refused to what? Change. He wasn't going to change. He loved his earthly possessions too much. His God was his earthly possession. And whatever amount that it added up to, that's who his God was. And he was the sinner talking to the sinless one. And the first thing you gotta do is admit to your sin and your guilt before you can hear anything of the good news. Yeah. And it was a brilliant theatrical approach it's a man's approach we see it all the time but it's not sincere it's not honest and Christ was so perfect in it. here's the law okay. okay fine and he knew he knew he was the sinner and he said okay now give it all up son this is the world get old to the new. Give it all mm -hmm. up. Let's just throw it in the trash can and now we're going to I ain't giving up that Cadillac or what. X. It, it could be any. It's ill relative the names. Man, it's not going to do it. Mm -hmm. so, if God doesn't put that spirit in you, you can't see, you can't hear, you can't understand. And you sure ain't gonna give up what you when you're in trouble. You got me, myself, or I up there for Jesus Christ. So you're blind, you're deaf, and yeah. you definitely got a hard heart. Yeah. You're in trouble. And he's talking to the sinless one. And when he called him good, he knew this was yeah. a special person. You are exactly right. It says that he was sad at the saying. At what saying? At what the Lord Jesus had to say. That's what he was sad at. What did the Lord say? Oh, well, I mean, that's, you know, Luther always said this, and that's great comfort's whole ministry is grace to the humble and law to the proud. You know, most of us, even sound evangelizers, would do would give this guy the good news. Even after he said all that, you know, they're like, "No, you haven't. You've broken them all. Here's the good news." Jesus piled more law on the guy because he was not broken under the law, mm -hmm. and you better be broken under the power and the weight of the law. Just like Christian in Pilgrim's Progress. He had that burden on his back. And it wasn't until he came to the cross that that burden fell off. That burden of the law, of the law keeping, fell off. The best thing we can do when someone says, oh, I've done all those with my life. Because it was a good question to start up. Hey, what should I do to inherit mm -hmm. eternal life? But lots of people like to ask that question when they think you're going to preach them right into the kingdom. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've had people sound, it sounds like a genuine question, but it's really not. It's just, they just want you to affirm that they're okay. No, you're not okay. You're too proud. That, that was his sin. It was self-righteousness. Yep. Check mark. Yeah. I've been good. Check mark. I've kept the commandments. Check mark. No adultery. No murder. No stealing. No lying. No defrauding. I've always honored my parents. Checking it off. And Jesus is like, well, I know this guy. I know his heart. I know yeah. everything he is to the core. So let's pile some more law upon this man because he needs to be broken before he'll come to me. 
with a contrite spirit. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't broken. What was bothering him was what? His mass earthly possessions and giving that up and losing that. If anything was bothering him, that's what bothered him. It wasn't his sin that was bothering him. He, it, it says it down there. He went away grieved, okay? Okay, did he go away grieved because he had much sin? Does it say he went away grieved because his sin was so much and as Justin said, he couldn't carry the load. That's why he went away grieved. No, he goes away grieved because he has what? Great possessions. He just couldn't give it up. He just could not give it up. His earthly treasures, his worldliness, drove him. The rich young ruler was driven to succeed earth, earth, earthly wise, worldly wise. To gain, to get more, to get more, to get more. Listen, I work for people like that. Driven. Worldly driven. They have so much and I sit there and scratch my head sometimes and think, and think dear gracious, You've got more than you'll ever spend and you keep working for more and more and more. Just driven for that. But you know, there was one too that was driven, but he was driven in the wrong way, in a different wrong way, and that was Saul who later was named Paul, okay? And it's amazing how the Lord takes certain individuals and certain individuals have such a drive for worldly success or worldly things and the Lord comes in and as Bob said, the Spirit of God comes in and shatters all that, just shatters who they are, okay? But leaves the drive but points them in the direction of Christ. He wasn't willing to be the disciple. He just wasn't willing. And it's, you know, it's not having the great possessions. It's the attitude about the great possessions. Joseph of Arimathea was a follower of Christ. And 
he had great possession. Lydia, she was rich, the seller of purple. She was a follower of Christ. She was rich. Abraham was a millionaire multiple times over. Jacob, same way. Having possessions mm -mm. is not sinful. Possessions are neither sinful nor are they righteous. It is the attitude about them. Yeah. Now, are we worshiping him? This guy was worshiping his own righteousness by affirming all the law that Christ poured on him. Oh, I'm good. And then his attitude toward his possessions showed he had broken the first four commandments as well as the ninth. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he couldn't he couldn't see past who he was. He couldn't see past his great wealth and as Justin said it exactly right, it's not the wealth, it's his attitude towards the wealth. And there's so many preachers that will scold people to death saying, You need to sell everything you got. Give it to the poor, live in a cardboard box under a bridge, or you're not a real Christian. You're not a radical Christian. You're not sold out for Christ if you don't do that. Where does it say that? Yeah. It doesn't say that anywhere. No. No. It's what your attitude about the things yes. God has given you. Are you worshiping the Creator, or are you worshiping the creation? The creation. That's what idolatry is always about here. Worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And here you're talking about a human being who had great riches, and because if you if you move down, you're exactly right. Verse 23, and Jesus looks around. Jesus stops, looks around, and says unto his what? Disciples. Looks around at all his disciples. How hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It's very rare that you bump into a believer that is committed to Christ and yet worth a lot of money themselves, worldly wise or earthly speaking. It's very rare. It's a small minority. Small minority. Small, yes. Small. Yes. And he talks about it constantly. It's the very small group that doesn't let money and yes. power get if it's an obstacle, it's an obstacle to Christ. And there there's what he's really showing this boy. You got possessions, you can't see me. You can't, son. Wait a minute. I can't. No, you can't see me. And you can't see the world that you're going to have to go out and work in. See, Paul, Paul had it. He had power. Take that village and move them back and whatever happens to him. And make sure you get any money. He had it all. He gave it all up. And he looks at that past life and he's very honest. He said, I despise myself. I'm a filthy rat. I was despicable. Yeah. And use my old life not to yeah. do it more. He learned that his life was but a vapor. Amen. It's but a vapor. It's all it is. Before you know it, your life is on the downside. It's on the backside. It's but a vapor. All the riches that the rich young ruler had would amount to nothing when he's, when he's, when he's on his deathbed, if you will. When he's breathing his last. It means nothing. Jesus looks around and he says unto his disciples, How hard shall they have riches enter into the kingdom of God? In other words, it is going to be extremely hard for those that are rich to enter into my kingdom. Why? Why is that? Because they will be holding on to their riches. Most of them. 
instead of holding on to me. The grip will be on the riches instead of me. You know, how many times do you hear, I think they've even made TV shows about this. Poor person wins the lottery, get rich, they're bankrupt, not too much longer. Wow. Yeah. It's a hard attitude. Yeah. Where's your heart? Yeah. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. It is a heart attitude, and his heart was tied up into his earthly possessions. But the disciples, they're astonished at his words, aren't they? They're astonished. They're amazed at what was just said. But Jesus answers again and says unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? They can't believe this. I mean, after all, if you got a lot of riches, you're going to thank somebody, so why not thank you, Jesus? But that's not how it works, is it? As Bob said, man in his humanness will thank himself, will pat himself on the back before he pats anybody else, let alone the Creator. Of the universe. But see, the disciples see this riches as we can use that in our yeah, mission. Absolutely. We can, we, there ain't no we. It is Jesus Christ. That, and this is a teaching moment, and Christ, what well, this next line he does <laughs> is so perfect, and he takes it back to reality. What yeah. he does this next verse. Is just so poignant and it puts the poor kids to thinking. Yeah, exactly right. So they're astonished at what he has to say. They're shocked. As Bob said, hey, I mean, we can use his money. I mean, we, we have trouble, you know, not trouble, but in their minds, you know, feeding 5,000 is huge. Women and children swelling over to 10. There's always somebody who needs money. And as Bob was alluding to in verse 25, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. Now you can use a lot of examples. But that one, people say, well, why the camel, why the needle? Well, think about it. You're not in 2021. I mean, camels were used as transportation, big gloppy animal. Needles were used for stitching and for sewing. The smallest hole you probably could create at that time, or at least one of the smallest of holes you could create at that time. Right? Do the same thing today. So you got this big goofy camel. Biggest thing in yeah, biggest thing in Palestine. Very interesting point. Biggest thing in Palestine. The smallest hole that you can create by man. One of the smallest. And the Lord Jesus said, You would have an easier time than taking the biggest thing in Palestine and ramming it through the hole of this needle than you will for a rich man to get into the kingdom. And, you know, for a long time, liberal Christianity has tried to explain that away. They're like, Well, the eye of the needle was the gate into the city, and the camel had to get down on its knees. It was really, really, really hard. And, and no, Jesus meant what he said, and he answers doubt about that in verse 27. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. This is exactly what he yeah. meant. So now the disciples and anybody else listening if, if they were just halfway listening before, now they're thoroughly listening now because he just said about shoving in a camel through an eye of a needle. Are you kidding me? As Bob always says, the master teacher, he's got a way of snatching up somebody's 
unattentiveness and bringing them back to reality and getting them to pay attention to what he's saying. See, that's the perfect is an attention getter. Yes. Where they were hopping. Wham. Yep. And now they're focused. Where should they yes. be focused? They're focused. So Jesus Christ, he brought it right back to where it needs to be, right? He's such a master. Yes. Such a master to where verse 26, and they were astonished. They were astonished at what he had to say. Yeah, would they be astonished if it was just a can I ask you down on his name? No. They wouldn't be astonished at that. They'd be like, yeah, that's kind of weird and hard, but they wouldn't be astonished. No. No. It was an impossible situation. Yes. Exactly. Listen to what happens at 26. Exactly right what you're saying. It was an impossible situation. Who then can be saved? There you go. That's the response he was looking for. There you go. Right? Amen. Amen. That's the response he wanted. The thing is, they have four people. In, in our context, in this country, there are no four people in this country. When the poorest of the poor are obese with type 2 diabetes, nobody's poor. Yeah. When the poorest of the poor has enough food to eat to get type 2 diabetes, then there are no poor people in this mm -hmm. country. There are poor people in Africa. There are poor people in, you know, in the Amazon province. There were poor people in Israel at this time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our eyes, we think poor, we don't know what poor is. No. No. No, we don't. And like I said, this is where he wanted them to be. <laughs> Whoever it was, who then can be saved? I don't know. One of them jumped up and said, who then can be saved? You can speculate on who that was till the cows come over. Who cares? Who then can be saved? Who in the world is going to be saved, Lord? Lord, okay, Lord, now you've got us all bum-fuzzled. Who in the world can be saved? Jesus looking upon them. Glad you asked that question. Right? Glad you asked that question. Amen. With men, what Justin and Tina just said, with men... It is impossible. But not with God. For with God all things are possible. And this is another one of these passages of Scripture where people take the little chunk of it out and say, with God everything's possible. With God everything's possible. You know what I mean? Just... You can do anything you want to do, young man, with your life because with God everything's possible. No, you can't do everything, anything you want to do in your life because you're just not smart enough to do anything you want to do in your life. Not everybody can be a president. Not everybody can be a doctor or a nurse or a pharmacist or whatever else, okay? Some people got the talent to do certain trades. Some people don't. However you want to look at it. No, it's, that's not how, how it is. That's not what the verse is saying. The verse is going right back to what? Salvation. With God, this is impossible. What do you mean? I mean, you can just branch over to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and verse 5. We are dead in our sins and trespasses. Spiritually dead. When something is spiritually dead, what happens? When I drive home, exactly, when I drive home and I go buy a groundhog that's dead, I don't care how many times I get out of the car and kick it in the head to wake it up, it's not going to wake up. Right? It's dead. Crazy analogy, but hey. It's dead. It doesn't come back.
King James says about Lazarus, he was four days dead, and by this time he stinks. Yeah. We are rotting, decaying corpses. Yeah. Son of man, can these bones live? Ezekiel didn't presume. He didn't say, oh yeah, yeah, they can live. He didn't say, no way, no chance. He said, God, only you know. Yeah. Only you know can these bones live. Yeah. Because it's for my grace. For my grace. Are you saved? Following up the two verses you mentioned a minute ago. For yeah. my grace, are you saved? Yep. Yeah. Through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. God. Nor of the will of man, nor of the will of flesh. Your flesh doesn't will to come into faith. That's impossible. Jesus says, with man, this is impossible. Man can never drag himself to salvation. Never. This is something divine. As Luther once said, when I come to faith, I realize it was something outside of me. It had nothing to do with me. It was something foreign to me. You know that term is alien righteousness. Yes. We have none of our own. It's only from outside yeah. of us. Only from Alien righteousness. Yeah. An alien righteousness. As Justice said a few minutes ago, you were stinky. You smelled horrible, spiritually speaking. And then one day the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ come upon you. You do not even realize it and awakened you from your spiritual death and drew you to himself, cleaned up your stinky carcass, if you will, and breathed spiritual life into you. Why? Because it was impossible for you to do it on your own. For with God, all things are possible. Peter's response to all this. Oh, Peter, right? It's been a while since we heard from Peter. Okay? There he comes. Isn't that funny how you'll go a little bit then you won't hear from Peter and all of a sudden he'll just come out with something out of, the, out of the blue. Then Peter began to say unto him, Lo, we have left everything. We've left it all. And we have followed you. We have followed you. Jesus from 28 on down answering Peter's question We'll talk to Peter about gain through loss. Your gain through loss. Interesting, this comes immediately after the rich young ruler who refused to give up his gain and then inevitably loses everything. His material wealth plus his eternal salvation is gone. There's no salvation there. This comes immediately after that. The Lord Jesus is going to talk to Peter. He's going to talk to the disciples about gain through loss. You will gain it all. Listen, you will gain it all if you willingly give everything up here, he said to the rich young ruler. Now, does that pertain to everybody? Well, sometimes, you know, sometimes the Lord says this. 
I need this or give it a little bit of this, give it a little of that, or whatever it may be. But you know what he's saying to the rich young ruler. He attacked, not attacked, but he hit the rich young ruler where the rich young ruler had his claws in. His material wealth. No. Yes. 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 Whatever, yeah, whatever your idol is, whatever your God is for the rich young ruler, obviously it was this material wealth. For others, it might be their grand education. It might be their property. I'm, I don't know. It might be their, I, I, whatever it is. Yes, whatever comes before you in Christ. Period. Period. A progressive sanctification, Tina said, exactly right, along with Lee, exactly right. It's, it's, it's a growing, isn't it? It's a growing. And it, sort of the events happened in Paul, or Saul, on his road to, to Damascus. When the Lord Jesus stopped him on that long, dusty road. He trembles and he says, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you, right there you know, Lord, I, what do you want me to do? I, I'll forget it. What? What is it that I need to do? The transformation wheels are spinning. Arise and go into the city and it shall be told thee what you must do. You never hear nothing where Saul said, well let me go back here and do this or let me go sell this or let me go take care of this. Or, I mean it was nothing like that. But he had that Holy Spirit in him at that time and he was ready. Yeah. Not of it. Not of anything that he had done, but by Christ's plan, yeah. he was ready. Yeah. And boy, did he make a firebrand with him. But that's just only through God can those things happen. And it was just like with Abraham. That was his own begotten son by his wife. Yeah. That, and he was rich and old, and he was at the apex of his life. He was ready to turn it all in. And I mean, the knife was just but inches off. Stop. I tested you. You did. You have all the stars in the heaven. He gave him that blessing, which gave us Christianity. Yeah. Yep. Gave us what we have today. God's plan. God's Only plan. God's plan. We can't do no. a. We can't carry the water bucket. No. Or the draft bucket. We can't do none of it. Yeah.
Yeah. And we respond, we grow in the faith, and we're used mightily for the glory of Christ. But to think about it all, even 20 years in down your, down your spiritual life, it's learning that as we close, the things of this world matter for nothing. They just don't. They just don't matter. There's no gain in anything outside of Christ. Tina said, vanity, vanity, all of it, it is vanity. Yeah, it's all vanity. So Lord will, we'll pick up somewhere around 28 and see what Peter has to say and Jesus' response to him as they move down, gain through Lost. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for this time this evening that you gave that you gave us, Lord, to look upon your truth, to look upon your word, the rich young ruler, Lord, and Lord, we thank you for all that you do. You be glorified and honored, you be praised. May we just rest in your mercy and your grace and bring us back here Sunday to once again to worship, to glorify you, to praise you. Thank you. We love you. Lord, lead us all home safely this evening, Lord. And awaken us tomorrow, if you so will. We continue to pray for Jay and as he's in the hospital. And Jana, who's there with him, and uh, she's not feeling too well. It's in your name we do pray. Amen.